Hello, my name is Sarah and this is my testimony. It might end up being very long because it's my entire life story and I hope you make it to the end. There's really no way to shorten this. So here we go. Uh, I was very fortunate to be born into a family that believed in God and was born again. Still is. And I grew up going to church, memorizing verses, singing all the songs, vacation Bible school. Uh, but what I, what really stands out to me actually is when I was as young as my mind can go back to, say like maybe five or six years old, I remember having a genuine connection with Jesus. Despite, you know, everything being parroted to me and being influenced by my family, I really did feel in my soul of souls that connection. And I had a desire, a strong desire to share the gospel and to share the love of Jesus. And I would hand out these little booklets called Chick Tracks, which were like little magazines. And at the, it would be a story that would lead you to the gospel at the end. And I loved handing them to people. And sometimes people didn't like it, but uh, this was my calling. And I knew it from a very, very young age. So years go by and before I was 10 years old, I was exposed to a lot of sexuality and, you know, from the TV, from the internet. And I became very curious, more curious than the other girls my age. So I was always quiet about it, but I was always very curious and I would find sneaky ways to watch things. I would find books to learn about things. So I was becoming very sexually advanced at a very young age, which I know happens to a lot of people. So puberty hits and I'm listening to Britney Spears, Mariah Carey, all these sexy singers and these are my role models now. I remember my mom did not want me to get Baby One More Time, her first album, and I couldn't understand why. Now I do. <laughs> but um, yes, I wanted to be sexy. I wanted all the boys to be after me. And so I acted a little desperate in this manner, meaning I was known in school for being promiscuous, for being that girl who flashed the boys in the back of the school bus for, you know, I would do the things that the other girls wouldn't at only 13. And I lost my virginity at that age. Uh, it became like an obsession for me. And even though I was still going to church and I still believed in God, it was in the background now. And I started to take it to the next level. I wanted to hang out and hook up with the older boys, older than me. So I would sneak out of the house at night and meet them in the woods. I would lie and stay, I'm say, say I'm staying after school for extra help, but really I wasn't. And I got caught one time and I got in a lot of trouble. So these were just the things I was doing at 13, 14 years old. And it was really worrisome for my family because they felt like they had no control over me. And if they did say like, you're not leaving your room, you're not going out, I would just wait until they weren't looking and I would leave and I wouldn't answer my cell phone, my little Nokia. And I, um, I feel very guilty for all of this, even though I've been forgiven, I, can't imagine what it would be like to be a parent and your young daughter is out doing whatever with whoever and you can't get a hold of her. 
So I was constantly putting my parents through this stress. And I just wanted them to, I would say, just stop caring about me. Like, let me do what I want, you know? And the straw that broke the camel's back was when a friend and I said, we're going to run away. And of course, we got caught the next day. <laughs> but the fact that I had the audacity to do that, <clears throat> it really... It really upset my family and they said, we're sending you away to a place where you'll get help. And I didn't believe them until I was on that airplane from New York where I lived to Texas. And my eyes were so swollen, I could barely open them from crying because it was like taking a wild horse and breaking them by sending me to this place. Now, it wasn't like super disciplinary. You know, you, yes, you had to do chores. If you didn't do your chores right, you got a strike. If you got this many strikes, you had to work in orange. And, you know, you would go to church every week. You would go to therapy every week. You would, there were so many benefits to this place and it probably saved my life. I um, I made friends with people there that, what is it? Um, is it 20 years later? Yeah, I'm still friends with them to this day. They're like, they're like soul sisters and soul brothers to me, these people, because we were all going through something, you know? Uh, so what's prominent about my experience at this place, it's called Heartlight Ministries, it had a great effect on me in terms of breaking me down. It almost broke me down to the point where I hated myself and I needed an escape from all these emotions. So I noticed some other girls would cut themselves. And I remember I had lightly cut myself in the past, back when I lived in New York, just to get attention, but I didn't really mean it. Now I wanted to do it because I meant it. Like I really hated myself and I just wanted to, I wanted to take my mind off of that emotional pain. So I tried it and it worked. It became my drug of choice. I, uh, I would do it on my thighs and I would sometimes carve words into myself. Sometimes I would do it during school because I'd be feeling a panic attack from just anxious with different emotions. And I went home back to New York after about a year of being here. And my relationship with my family was very much so healed. And I wasn't going to put them through any of that again. But now I felt very broken inside. I felt very empty, very dark. And there were times when I would be cutting myself that I, I remember not physically hearing a voice, but something telling me to do it. Like something was almost whispering in my ear like cut yourself, go deeper, you know, keep going. And it was a very demonic presence. So I continued cutting myself even after I came home back to New York and seeing the blood, it was like the deepest form of peace that I could find. So it was very addictive and a lot of people were concerned because they could see the marks on me. And I realized that I had to stop doing this because it was just, it was going to start causing drama and I didn't want to end up in a psych ward. So I started smoking pot, I started smoking a lot of pot. And I said, you know what? I'm going to stop cutting and just start smoking. And now I looked at marijuana as my savior 
and I would tell everyone like, oh, marijuana helped me stop cutting and I, and I, I idolized it. So this was probably around 16 years old now. And I was addicted to smoking cigarettes, my weed, like this became my life and I idolized music. So I would just get lost in Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and all this music. I found comfort in it. I was still very, very lonely and I felt very depressed inside. And I was using all of these things in an attempt to fill it. So one day when I was 19, I don't know why, but I wanted to go to church with my parents. They were going and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go. I must have been feeling kind of down, like really down to seek out God. And hold on. <laughs> so I go to church and I really want people to hear this, especially Christians, especially pastors. The message was about Satan. And not enough people are willing to talk about that. This is the message that woke me up. The preacher was telling us how Satan deceives us. He uses the things of this world to blind us from receiving that ultimate joy, the ultimate overflowing love of God. And this was the message that sparked the next thing that happened. I went home, started to, you know, light up my weed, do my normal thing, but I stopped and I realized this is Satan, this is what he's using right now to keep me blinded. And I looked around my room at all the posters covering my wall. And I said, this is also blinding me. I'm idolizing all these things that are doing nothing for me. And it's keeping me from the ultimate freedom. And this, this realization hit me so hard. It's undeniable. And I cried out, Jesus, I want you. I want you to take over my life. I don't want this anymore. And I don't know how long it was, but I was just sobbing. I was crying. I could barely speak, but God knew what, what was going on inside of my heart. I was letting go of myself and my ways and surrendering to his ways and this overflowing love filled me for the first time in my life. I didn't feel empty anymore. And I wasn't depressed anymore. And I quit smoking cigarettes and weed, cold turkey, everything. I took down all my posters and tons of CDs and I put it all in a black garbage bag and threw it out. I just, I wanted to just shed every part of me and be fully for Christ. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful moment. And I remember how happy my family was. And I wrote a letter, I typed up a letter and I sent it to all my friends and I told them what happened. And yeah, I, I can go back to that day right now and remember when I was saved. That's when I was saved. So now I'm very passionate about telling people this because it was so real. It was, it was like a 180 transformation for me. And I wanted to tell everybody. So I 
the church that I just went to, I told the pastor, like, let me, let me get on stage and tell everybody what happens. <laughs> and I did. And it affected a lot of people. And this guy comes up to me and he's like, what just happened to you just happened to me. Let's hang out and tell people about Jesus. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. So of course there was an attraction there. Long story short, we ended up getting married and now I'm 20 years old. So the foundation of our marriage was our faith. And what happens is a few years go by and we kind of lose interest in going to church, getting more, you know, into worldly things. And he starts doing research on all the contradictions in the Bible, which there are things that contradict each other because there are so many authors who wrote it. Anyway, that's another topic, but he, uh, he pointed me to a YouTube channel that is turning people into atheists daily because this guy makes a lot of points and I, I couldn't, I was shook. I was shook because I had believed in God my whole life. And even though I wasn't really living for God as best as I could, it still hurt me. It still hurt a lot that my husband at the time didn't want to believe in God anymore. So I said, let me look at this with an open mind, even though I'm super emotionally hurt that, you know, the foundation of everything is being pulled up from underneath me right now. Let me at least have an open mind and just listen to your point, listen to your, you know, what you're finding on this topic. And I'm not gonna lie, it was very convincing and the part of my flesh almost wanted to not believe anymore. So I could just live how I want. So we did, we, uh, we said, you know what? We don't believe this anymore. And it really shook up our families. They could not believe us, but we didn't. And it's no surprise that after that, that depression set back in for me. And now I started to use alcohol as a way to fill it. And this had a very detrimental effect on me. It almost made me someone that I don't even know. And it possessed me to do a lot of things that were not me. And he was unaware and I felt like I couldn't talk to him. The communication wasn't there anymore. And I really, I just wanted to die. I didn't want to be alive anymore. I didn't want to be married anymore. I just, I was done. I, I didn't feel any purpose. So I kept having this fantasy of how I would kill myself. And the plan was, okay, I'm going to drink enough where I can get to this level of craze. And then I'm going to drive over the Robert Moses Bridge and I'm going to go as fast as I can and then just veer off. And hopefully that kills me. That was the fantasy in my mind. And I would think about it often. And it would bring me comfort to think about this. Like if I was having a stressful moment, that's what my mind would go to. And I said, wow, this is not right. This is just not how I should be living. 
So the alternative to killing myself was getting a divorce because I could not live with him anymore. And yes, I was doing a lot of wrong things, but there was things on his part too. That video is not about this and I'm not here to bash and rehash, but uh, I ended up getting divorced and now this like whole empowerment came over me. So at this point, I'm 27. Okay, I was married for seven years. Basically my entire 20s, I was married. So my mindset now was, I'm gonna relive my 20s. And <laughs> And I went on a wild free-for-all, wild, wild free-for-all. And at the peak of this free-for-all, I moved to a state, uh, I, knew, I moved to North Carolina, a town called Asheville, because I'm a musician and a singer, and they were known for local musicians. And it was just a really cool town. So I went to live there, and this is the first time in my life I'm on my own, away from family, left to my own devices. I'm living in a house, renting out a room, and this is just a super indulgent town for me. Uh, my drinking picked up at its peak, where I would start my day drinking, like whiskey in my coffee, and my thermos I'd bring to work had alcohol in it and it would just continue and I'd stay up to 4 a.m. in the morning drinking, wake up in the morning, do it all over again. So part of me was like, yeah, I'm having the time of my life. I'm free. I'm, you know, meeting people. I'm singing every night. I'm dancing, this, that, the other thing, you know, expressing my individuality, you know, but... <laughs> I was so, I was becoming more depressed than ever. I felt so alone. The more I tried to fill that hole in me, the more, the deeper, the more expanded that hole became. And so I started, it began again, the fantasies of killing myself. And it's not that I ever wanted to kill myself. It was just like these thoughts were, given to me and then they would play on repeat almost on purpose i always felt like there was some dark entity that wanted me dead so my new fantasy was well i'm gonna get really drunk and drive off a mountain cliff because there was a lot of winding mountain roads there and oh then i started to get involved with the wrong people and I was feeling a little desperate financially. And, you know, I'd go out dancing. And one night this girl came up to me and she's like, you're a good dancer. I'm starting a go-go dancing business. I was like, cool. Yeah. So I tried that out. I tried it once and I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> because... I could just see the road that would have went down. And then I had another friend there who was a stripper and she was like, you would do so good. And I was, <laughs> she's like, I make so much money. I'm like, it was tempting. It was very tempting. But no, I, that would have, uh-uh. And I, I just saw all these doors opening up to me now, different pathways. And what's funny is my grandma texted me, who's also my boss, and she's like, we really need you at the store, family business. Can you come back to New York and work? And I was like, wow, that was a sign to me that I had to get out of there. So I was like, absolutely, I'm coming back home, done. So that's that. Now I have partied so much that I'm sick of it. And I decided to take a break from drinking. 
And I started to crave spirituality. I started to seek something deeper than this external world. But I didn't want to go to Christianity. I, I had hang up towards it. I said, Christians are closed minded people. They, you know, not accepting this, that, the other thing. So I was on this side of the coin that was kind of anti Christian because I'm a very open minded person. And in order to be a true follower of Christ, you have to be closed minded on a lot of things. That's just part of the package. So I delved into New Ageism and I thought I had found it. So it all started with crystals. Then it became in tarot cards and I was so intrigued with tarot cards. I would spend hours studying them and, and the symbolism and, and, and it is fascinating. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of fascinating things about all this new age stuff. So it's very, very deceptive and easy to be drawn into for someone seeking healing for someone that's seeking more than what this life has to offer. It has a huge draw to it and it comes in sheep's clothing. Reiki, I got into, I took the course, I did the 200 hour yoga teacher training, I did all these things in an attempt to draw closer to my soul to, to fill that hole. And what I was doing was inviting in a presence, and I didn't know it. I thought that, oh, I have my spirit guides. Jesus is one of my spirit guides. I got my angels, my spirit team. One of them is a this, one of them is a... So this was my thinking. And I believed that I was a god, a goddess, and that we are all gods, and that society doesn't want us to know that because it would, you know, overthrow the government. So they created religion to keep people submissive and... This was my whole mentality. And I was very, very, you know, passionate about it. So, whew, couple prominent experiences after this, after I got heavily into new age stuff. First time, uh, a friend and I invited a psychic over. That night, I was having a dream that I was demon possessed. And I woke myself up because I was like hovering over her in the bed. And I don't know what I was about to do, but there was something possessing me in the dream and in real life. She woke up screaming and I started yelling like, what's going on? What's going on? And we both felt something in the room with us. It was a very dark, eerie pit of your stomach feeling inner knowing that something is in the room that is not good, that, that hates you. And this was the same night we had a psychic over in the house. So... Ooh, that was so scary. I still remember it. All right, so that's that time. The next time I had a, a scary experience was the guy I was seeing, I slept over his house and I always felt a, a negative energy in his apartment because of the people that were there and uh, other things he was doing. But anyway, I would still sleep over. And so one day he leaves for work I wake up in a sleep paralysis. I cannot move, but I'm awake. I'm fully conscious. And all I hear right next to me is a low gurgling voice speaking in another language. And in my mind, I'm like, am I dreaming right now? Is this like, am I just hearing things? But it was prominent. And I could hear like there was, and 
I looked it up after because this has never happened to me before. And in the new age realm, this is a visitation from a spirit. This spirit did not feel good though. And it was definitely a demon. So fast forward, I'm living single. I am feeling very empty inside, going from relationship to relationship, looking for some kind of romantic fling to fill me. And then I would feel empty inside and numb and I didn't want anything to do with that person. And I'd go on to the next person and it was so exhausting. And yeah, it's just, at one moment I would feel very empowered, like, oh, I'm on these dating apps, I could get whoever I want. And then I would feel like nothing. And I'd feel like, why do I even bother? Like, what? what's the point of living, you know? Because the physical pleasure, it doesn't fulfill us. It's, it's such a temporary fleeting fulfillment. So if, if you're empty, if you feel empty inside and you're using physical pleasures to fill you, it is only going to make it worse. And so I would numb myself using alcohol, but this was also making me depressed. So I saw one of my friends post on Facebook you know, I'm eight months sober and I'm like, you know what? I need to get sober. That's the answer here. And he invited me to go to AA with him. And I haven't been in a church in a long time. So I go to church with him to the AA meeting. And I didn't really feel like I identified as an alcoholic. I really identified more as just an empty person looking to fill the hole with whatever I could find. So anyway, I went and something they said, it sparked like a familiarity. And they were talking about how they have to surrender to something higher than themselves to get over the addiction. And I'm like, wow, this sounds so familiar. This sounds like something I used to believe in. And it felt strangely comforting being in a church again. So I took this all as a sign. And I decided, you know what? What have I got to lose? I'm going to find a local church and I'm going to go on Sunday and just, just see how it goes. If I don't like it, I don't go back. So, whew. So I go to a local church called Center Point in Bayshore. And wouldn't you know, the message that day was, what does God think of psychics, astrology, new ageism? And it couldn't have been more clear that God was speaking to me and calling me back home and I remember after that, just going to the beach and the beach is where I feel closest spiritually. And I just was dwelling on the fact that I had denied Jesus, the Bible, Christianity for so long, but I was craving, I was craving it. I was craving my relationship with Jesus again. And it's as if I felt him saying to me, I never left you. I never left you. And I went through all of those things. I went through all of those things so that I could see all these different sides and come to people with more understanding. Because I know accepting Jesus and 
the Christian faith is challenging. The path is narrow. And it sounds like foolishness to many. But God uses that which is foolish to confound the wise because it's not through our own understanding that we will receive God. It's not through anything we can do. It is a pure heart surrender. That's it. It's that realization that it's not my way, it's your way. And come as you are, whether it doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is, what lifestyle you've lived, what you've done, it does not matter because God's love is more powerful than anything we have done. It is so powerful, it covers a multitude of sins. And we are innately sinful creatures. But it's all to glorify God. The whole setup, the whole plan from the beginning was all meant to glorify God. And not ourselves. But with that comes so many blessings. Anyway, I got off topic for a second. Not really, but... So... So I start realizing that I want Jesus in my life again, right? And this time the letting go process was a little slower. I still have all my crystals and everything. I'm like, you know what? I, I'll get rid of my tarot cards. But my crystals, I mean, I've spent probably over $1,000 on this. It's pretty. I'm not going to use it anymore. I'm not going to idolize it anymore or look at it or put my faith in it like I used to, but I'm going to keep them there. Keep my dream catcher. Keep, you know, my things. Um, also, I didn't want to get off my dating apps. But what happened was I went on a date with someone and I was like, oh, he's spiritual, like, so I could talk to him about Jesus and stuff. A lot of people say they're spiritual. But we went on a date, and we were sitting at a bar, and he says to me, I just saw someone standing behind you, but they're gone. He's like, that's very weird. He's like, I definitely saw something behind you. And I'm like, okay. That same night, <laughs> this is just freaking me out. That same night, I have a very vivid lifelike dream, kind of like the dream from when the psychic was over. It felt like that. And in this dream, now I'm living alone. I'm staring into these red eyes and they're just like staring right into my eyes as if they are my eyes. And I suddenly wake myself up because what's coming out of my mouth is another language in a very deep, deep tone that isn't my tone. So it's like something was speaking through me. Whew. And I felt something in the room with me again, that same demonic presence in the room with me. And something in my mind said, there is a fight for your soul. The enemy sees that you're coming back, that you're being drawn to God again, and he's threatened. He thought he had you. He thought he had you deceived and blinded and distracted. And so he's threatened. And now there's a fight, a spiritual warfare going on. And I was made very aware of that in that moment. And the next day I'm like, all right, it is clean out time. And I got rid of every crystal, every, everything that reminded me of my old self. I deleted all the dating apps. I said, it is time to shed again. I did it when I was 19. I'm doing it again now. And I'm coming back home. And I just, I got rid of everything gone. I don't want any remnant 
of anything that that was the old me. And I prayed over my apartment. I said, any dark entity here, get out. Ugh. That's when, when I had that dream, that's when I was like, all right, it's done. I, I know what's going on now. So, <clears throat> and that was just like a few months ago. So this is very, it's all very familiar because of what happened to me when I was younger. It's like I'm picking up where I left off, really. I don't feel like a brand new Christian. I just feel like I came back home. And whew, all I have to say is I totally resonate with anyone who has found a sense of healing in Reiki and feels like this connection with the universe. And I was like that. And let me tell you something. If you want to feel the deepest connection that goes beyond what New Age will offer you, wait until you experience what it's like to know Jesus. Wait until you experience what it's like to witness the hand of God in your life daily and crazy synchronicities sending people into my life that like, it's just, if you appreciate magical things and you want to work with the higher realm, new ageism, I understand the draw, but you're inviting in a presence that you do not know. You don't know what you're inviting in. You think you know. And it's dangerous. I'm just saying this from experience. I've been there. And I thought I was finding the thing that was going to carry me through this life and keep me fulfilled and happy. And I can't tell you how many rituals, full moon rituals and candle spells I would do to try and rid rid myself of negative feelings. You think it's working, but it's really not. The ultimate healer is Jesus Christ. The ultimate physician is Jesus Christ. And he gives gifts to his followers. Hands-on healing is real. It originated from Jesus. It's all real. Supernatural gifts. But the ones from God are the ones that we want. So basically, what else do I have to say? Being a Christian isn't about being perfect. You know, you just... We, we are under God's grace. That doesn't mean that we could sin all the time, but it's living a life of repentance and growing closer to him. It's saying, all right, I see that my flesh wants to do this. That's not honoring God and praying about it. He listens. So I just want to pray for everybody listening to this right now, that there is something in this video that plants a seed, something in this video that, that I said that clicks in your brain, that stays there, that causes you to have a desire to know Christ, to draw closer to him, and that anything that is blocking you Anything the enemy is using to keep you from the ultimate love, peace, and freedom, I pray in the name of Jesus that it is removed from your life. In 
Jesus' name, amen. And thank you for watching. Please share this with anyone you think would resonate. And, uh, yeah, and it's Christmas Day. I figured what better day to, to take a video of my testimony, you know? So, all right, I'm going to cut it off here because I'll keep rambling.